Hello, LibertyCon. This is Meet the Newbies panel part five. Yes, I'm doing another one of these things. And tonight we have a good little round table of authors from around the country, and we'll get to them all here in a second. Uh, let's see. We will start with Eeny, Meeny, Miny, Mo. Jane, you get to go first. Oh, boy. All right. My name is Jane Linskold, and I'm talking to you from Albuquerque, New Mexico, where we're very excited because it just might think about raining. Um, I'm the author of going on 30 published novels and over 70 published short stories, as well as the uh, book on writing, Wanderings on Writing, collection of short stories, curiosities, any number of nonfiction, including a literary biography of the late Roger Zelazny. I am currently working on a bunch of projects, one of which involves one of your Liberty Con regulars, David Weber. And we're back to doing our Star Kingdom series, which are way, way prequels to the Honorverse and feature honors uh, great, great something grandmother, Stephanie Harrington, who was the first person to make contact with tree cats. So they're marketed as young adult, but we have readers from all over the place. We just turned into Bain a few months ago, the fourth book in the series, and we're going to be working on the fifth one. It's under contract, hopefully fairly soon. On my own front, I've just sold to Bain a two book series, which may turn out being more, but right now they're called the Overware Duology, and they are a portal fantasy that sort of reverses a lot of the tropes in a portal fantasy by instead of it being kids who go off and have wonderful adventures, it's three ladies, the youngest of whom is in her mid fifties. And they get summoned to another realm by three 20 somethings, all of whom are lying about just how bad their problems are. And they're there to be Gandalf and Dumbledore and all the other people who solve problems. And uh, it's a heck of a lot of fun. And I guess the, the thing I can say about it from the point of view of the publisher is my offer included a release date, which to those of you who work in this business know just doesn't happen very often. So they're as excited about it as I am. Okay, I'll turn the ball over to somebody else. All right, let's see. Let's go ahead with Jenny, since she's been having a little bit of technical issues on her end, just to make sure we get her before she lags out again. You got to unmute. <laughs> Looper real I'll stuff. lag out one way or the other. Okay, let's try that again from the top. <laughs> I'm Ginny Koch. I write the Alien Catherine Kitty Cat series for Daw Books. I have uh, 16 novels so far in that series, and I have about four or five other novels out. Uh, I'm in a host of anthologies. I write under a variety of pen names including J.C. Koch, G.J. Koch, Anita Ansall, Gemma Chase, and A.E. Stanton. And I think I've forgotten one, and I apologize to that name. I write in all lengths and in all genres, and I am very excited to be here. I think that was it. All right. Um, let's see. To cut our odds of more lagging issues, let's go with Naomi next, since she's still traveling right now. Hi, my name is Naomi Bean. Um, I am coming from I-90 right now, uh, but normally I'm in North Carolina. I'm a PhD candidate at the Wake Forest School of Medicine. I study neuroscience, specifically sensory neuroscience. Um, I look at how um, information is combined in the brain, particularly auditory and visual cues. Um, so we have a lot of different projects on that. Uh, so I study the basics of that concept. I study the rules of the concept, but I also look at how um, Q value impacts how information is uh, combined in the brain. And that is relevant to a lot of uh, sensory disorders that we might think of like autism, schizophrenia, um, and attention deficit disorder. Uh, of interest for this panel or for this um, event, I study a, a, a blindness called hemianopia, and our lab has found a way to ameliorate or dampen or lessen the outcome, the blindness, 
uh, that we see in patients using multi-sensory cues. So um, I was really excited to be invited um, to, to speak on a panel about um, brain uh, injury and rehabilitation. Really cool. Okay, so you're a research contact. So everybody, take a note. Get her contact info at the end of this. We got a neuroscientist here. Absolutely. Um, yes. All right. So now to the ugly mugs in this, the room, let's go eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Let's go with Michael Brotherton next. Okay. I have unmuted now. So uh, I'm a uh, professor of astronomy at the University of Wyoming, and my uh, specialty are the most luminous of the active galactic nuclei known as quasars. And quasars are objects powered by supermassive black holes uh, accreting surrounding gas, one of these hot swirling disks. Uh, and they're the most luminous objects in the universe and outshine the galaxies they live in. So, I think those are pretty cool. Uh, I use the Hubble Space Telescope, the VLA in New Mexico, Chandra X-ray Observatory, and our own Wyoming Infrared Observatory here called WIRO, and pretty much any other telescope that I can get my hands on. Um, I'm also a science fiction writer. Um, I tend to write hard science fiction, outer space, far future, lots of astrophysics. Um, I have two novels out some time ago, Star Dragon and Spider Star, both from Tor. Uh, being a, a professor keeps you kind of busy. Uh, I mostly have time for short stories these days, uh, mostly in anthologies or, or venues like Nature. Um, and I write some nonfiction articles here and there as well. Uh, I'm also the founder of the Launchpad Astronomy Workshop for Writers. Uh, I've been doing that since 2007. Um, we missed last year due to COVID for the first time, but we are having another workshop this year. Uh, but basically we bring in about 12 to 15 professional science fiction writers uh, to Laramie, Wyoming every summer for a crash course in astronomy. And the idea is that we teach them uh, how to communicate the science better, give them some confidence about the science. And then um, ideally, they can put that in their work. We get a little self-education to the public. We inspire the next generation of scientists and hopefully we prevent another Armageddon, at least movies like Armageddon that are full of really terrible science errors. Uh, I do some editing, uh, edited some anthologies like Science Fiction by Scientists for Springer. And uh, I am uh, on the editorial board of Springer Science and Fiction series that uh, another one of the people on the panel may bring up. Oh, and since Patrick Swenson's here, I'll, I'll mention he, uh, he bought and published a couple of my first short stories back in the 90s uh, for his very fine, short, dark uh, science fiction uh, magazine, Tailbones. Okay, I'm done. Um, the, the group you mentioned, uh, can anybody join that? Uh, Launchpad Astronomy Workshop for Writers is by application. Um, we only have a live version. Uh, there's a lot of things we do in person, visiting telescopes and having interactive discussions that, that we haven't wanted to do online. Um, but I, I generally have funding from NASA, uh, National Science Foundation, and in recent years, uh, CIFWA. Uh, and so it's all expenses paid except for the travel to get to the workshop. Well, um, um, how, how do people contact you for that? Um, we have a website, uh, launchpadworkshop.org, um, and we've just finished our round of applications for this summer, unfortunately, but we anticipate being open again next spring. All right. Um, well, since you mentioned him, let's go with Patrick next. And my uh, friend and uh, a writer who I published quite a bit of, James Van Pelt, just was excited that he's got got into Launchpad for the summer. So yeah, I'm, uh, so Patrick Swenson, I am uh, by, by day <laughs> for paying the day uh, job bills uh, is the, uh, I'm a teacher, I'm a high school English teacher. Uh, we have this week and one more week to go. It's really late here in the Seattle, Washington area, getting out of school, but uh, this will be, 
I'll be finishing my 36th year of, of teaching. So it's it's been a while. Um, and I commiserate with Michael as far as, you know, teaching and trying to get writing time in, it can be a challenge. And these days, summers, which are usually the times for me to get a lot of writing in, is time to also catch up with my press, because I have a small press now too. Tailbones is no more. That went from 1995 to 2009. There were 39 issues uh, over that course of time. And then I decided to put that aside. I started Fairwood Press, just a book line in the year 2000. That is still going, going strong. Uh, but I stopped the magazine so I could concentrate more on my writing. My first uh, novel came out from tour called The Ultra Big, uh, sorry, The Ultra Thin Man, which is a space opera noir, I guess is what I would call it. A sequel came out a few years later called The Ultra Big Sleep. And I'm working on the third in the trilogy, which is The Ultra Long Goodbye. And I have a, a book coming out this November called Rain Music which is a uh, ghost story set out the Olympic Peninsula rainforest with music and magic. Uh, I have a story in the anthology that's coming out in uh, that September also, or I guess it's November. No, it's in August actually, uh, which I was on a panel for earlier, which was the David Boops. Uh, and uh, I know that Alex has one and Je Jeannie was here and Jane was here. Um, what's that called again? <laughs> um, Gunfight on Europa Station, and uh, another one coming out this summer from Loxa Media, and uh, that's that's it in that respect. I do with Fairwood Press. I do about six or seven or eight titles a year. That's about all I have time to do from other writers, and I have a, also the director and um, head guru for the Rainforest Writers Village, which is a writers retreat. It's out at Lake Quinault and the Olympic Peninsula every year. So, except for last year, which was, or this year earlier, which was virtual. But that's me. Let's see. Let's go with Michael Haspel next. Did I say that right? Haspel? Yes, you said that right. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. I was having a little trouble finding the unmute. I'm calling you guys from uh, Stargate country out here in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Uh, I am an Air Force veteran. I did some interesting things in my career, uh, such as being an ICBM crew commander. And I was a Air Force launch director for the 2001 Mars Odyssey. So <clears throat> that was, those were the highlights of my career. Uh, I write uh, science fiction, fantasy, and horror, but more so fantasy lately. And uh, my debut novel came out from Tor. It's called Graveyard Shift, and it's about an immortal pharaoh in modern-day Miami uh, masquerading as a cop and taking on an ancient vampire conspiracy. So it is a noir urban fantasy, um, and it's a lot of fun. Uh, it is... I will warn you, not for the faint of heart, it is kind of violent. I went a little bit overboard on that. Um, and uh, I have also a story called The Penultimate Stand of Pina Grocchi, also coming out in uh, Gunfight at Europa Station, um, which is a lot of fun. I can't wait for folks to discover that. And uh, I think it's coming out next year. I have another uh, Mankara, that's my pharaoh. Uh, from Graveyard Shift, another short story featuring him called Storm Surge that will be in the No Game for Nights anthology for Bane. And I think that's coming out uh, next year. I'm also a writer for Black Library. Um, that is Games Workshop's uh, Warhammer publishing arm. Uh, unfortunately, I can't talk about anything I did for them because it's tied to product releases. So uh, it's all kind of hush hush. Uh, I'm also the uh, co-host of a podcast called The Long War, which is a Warhammer 40K game analysis podcast. Uh, it is kind of rude and crude. Um, 
unfortunately has too much scatological humor, but that's <laughs> that's what <laughs> things go for. Um, and I'm also uh, hosting uh, my own podcast called Quantum Froth Dispatches, which announces does like story analysis and author interviews. And right now, our ongoing meta topic is what was in the water in 1982, because in 1982, all these classic films that birthed massive franchises uh, came out. We had Conan the Barbarian, we had First Blood, The Thing, Fast Times at Ridgemont High, E.T., the list goes on and on, Blade Runner. So I, I just pick one of these, you know, Star Trek II, for instance, and I'll do a deep dive into like all the stories that are attached to it and and uh, so that you can kind of get it in one place. And it turns into kind of a six or seven hour long series of episodes about that. Uh, I am also currently working on uh, some stories for Curious Fictions, which is a new website that's kind of like um, Patreon, but for authors. So it's kind of like Substack, but it's more for fiction. And uh, I'll be announcing that soon. It's I'm still getting everything set up and I'm working on a series, a fiction collection of my own called Umbra Case Files that ties into the same characters that were in Graveyard Shift and kind of that same universe. And that's what I've got going on right now. All right. And Black Library is a tough one to get into. That That's impressive, dude. It's rough. It took me 20 years. <laughs> you know, I, I played Warhammer and it's like, that's a lot of data that I, I just, I got other things to do. <laughs> so more, more, it's like, oh, dude, you know, awesome. Um, Steven, let's go with you next. All right. Thanks very much. Um, my name is Stephen Cass. I am originally from Ireland, but I'm coming to you from my teeny tiny apartment in uh, New York where we have been weathering out the pandemic um, by day, I am a science and technology journalist, so I currently write for IEEE Spectrum, which is the best magazine, I, which I like to call the best magazine no one's ever heard of, but I suspect in this audience, there I see some nods, a piece of people have heard of it, um, which is a lot of fun to work for because I'm their special projects editor, so I get to like make you know weird things, demonstrating various bits of technology on the clock, which is always a lot of fun. Um, but, uh, why I'm here has more to do with sort of science, my science fiction life and sort of the currently active project that I'm working with is, um, I'm working with, uh, Kevin Grazier, um, who is a science advisor, things like Balzer Galactic and Eureka. And he and I work together on volume one and volume two of Hollywood science, which actually Michael is the series editor on. And, um, the point of these books is, is actually one. I think to explain maybe science to both to to people who like enjoy science fiction movies, and um, but we do really try to take a different tack to some to some um, sort of commenters that we really try to like focus on the positive aspects of when a show gets something right. Um, so, like for example, Predator. No one's ever going to say Predator is the most rigorously hard science fiction movie of all time. But if you want to explain how infrared sort of detectors work and stuff like that, there's actually a pretty good example in, in that movie. So we're doing that. And also we're trying to explain to scientists in this book that when, uh, you know, screenplays get something wrong or they don't do something, oftentimes it's not because they're being lazy or stupid, but there are really good storytelling or production reasons why you're doing something in 30 seconds that would normally actually take three months um, in reality. So those, those books are a lot of fun and, um, so you can get these two now. And actually, I think they're just available in audiobook. I know this because I actually got a royalty check for positive money for like the first time in my life because somebody made a sale of an audio sale. So yay. Um, book three is being worked on with Jessica Kale. I'm not working on book three. But book three is working on with Jessica Kale and Kevin. And I'll probably will come back for book four at some time in the future. So that's the ongoing project. And then some other science fiction projects I've gotten, I've gotten lucky enough to work on it at some of the outlets that I've been, because when you work at science and technology outlets, it's not that far to to start talking about science fiction. So for uh, like MIT uh, Technology Review, I did these two anthologies the, 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 of uh, TRSF. The first was called TRSF, but the, this nice Chris Foss cover, and then it became 12 Tomorrows. And um, this series is, is continued under a different editor now under MIT Press, but, but uh, these are um, some really uh, amazing things to do. And that kind of got me into into 
science fiction editing and, and editing fiction. And that is finally flowered. Now I finally actually have just recently finished up my own first novella and science fiction story. So I will uh, begin the fun process of being a, a first time author and trying to sell those. So uh, that's about it for me. All right, Alex. That was a great transition because like Stephen, I too am in New York City. Uh, Brooklyn, New York, to be precise, uh, and uh, it is a city that I've lived in uh, since the 90s, and uh, um, it's a venue for a lot of my own writing. Um, I'm a relative newbie when it comes to uh, to writing compared to many of this on this panel. I started writing in 2005, and no one was more surprised than me when I sold my first story, sold my second story, and continued on to um, continue to write writing short fiction because it's kind of like popcorn. You can't stop. Uh, you know, uh, if you if you enjoy it. Uh, so now I have about 120 different short stories published in uh, all sorts of places like Analog, Strange Horizons, Nature, uh, Galaxy's Edge, uh, all sorts of magazines and, and, and lots of anthologies from Bain and other publishers. Uh, I've had the privilege to write in the worlds of uh, much uh, more talented writers than myself, like uh, in uh, Larry Correa's Monster Hunter universe, uh, in Chuck Gannon's uh, Kane Reardon uh, universe and uh, in many other IPs uh, uh, tied into video games and other pro uh, and other properties, uh, sometimes credited and sometimes not. Um, in addition to the short stories, uh, I also uh, translate stories from Russian, uh, which is my, my first language. English is my third language. So writing in English is, can be a little challenging, but um, uh, I geek out uh, about some of the stories that uh, that I can read in uh, in my native language that, and I really want to share those stories with uh, the rest of the American readers because some of them are really, really, really cool. Uh, and so, uh, much more recently, about the last four years or so, um, I started uh, doing a lot of uh, short story translations, which also uh, landed me some gigs, uh, having translated now for films, television games and other cool projects. Uh, so uh, of those stories, you can read them at places like uh, Asimov's, uh, you know, Tor.com, FNSF, uh, just about most of the major magazines. And I just recently wrote uh, an essay, a nonfiction essay about this, the history of Russian science fiction for Clark's World, which is uh, up in, uh, I believe the, the last month's issue. So uh, it's online to read for free. Um, now, I've also uh, gone on to uh, wear other hats, such as editor and publisher. Uh, I run a small press, uh, much smaller than Patrick's, because it's an, also a one-man operation, but even smaller, uh, called UFO Publishing. And I've put out a bunch of anthologies, primarily the Unidentified Funny Object series of humorous science fiction and fantasy anthologies, for which uh, I've been very privileged to publish uh, a number of stories by Gene here. Uh, as well as all sorts of other authors from Neil Gaiman and George R. R. Martin and all the way through to uh, a number of people for whom uh, their story in my anthology was their first sale and they've gone on to do uh, some great things. Uh, I was very proud, for example, to have published, uh, it wasn't the first publication for him, but the first professional publication for Marco Clues was in the very first volume of UFO and he has gone on to become a super successful author uh, with one of the Amazon imprints. Um, so most of my short fiction is collected uh, in a couple of, um, uh, of collections, uh, explaining Cthulhu to Grandma and other stories is first. The title story in that collection uh, won the Wispa Award. Uh, and the Golem of Denim 7 is second. Uh, that story was nominated for the Canopus. Uh, and of course, since I write a lot of humor and am known for humor, I've decided that my very first novel was going to be Grimtown Fantasy. And it came out right before the pandemic started, so perfect timing. Uh, it's called A Reading is Crown, and it's available online and at fine uh, booksellers everywhere. And it's basically sort of my take on how Game of Thrones should have been done, but in one book, definitively without sequels and all at once. So if you, if you enjoy that sort of thing, do check it out. Uh, I also run an online magazine that's free to read called Future Science Fiction Digest. And this is a magazine that uh, primarily focuses on fiction from outside the Anglosphere. So there's lots of translations, as well as stories that are written by authors who live in uh, and grew up in countries uh, where, where English was not their native language. So we're finding a lot of really cool, really different stories 
that may not quite fit in some of the other markets. Uh, and some of them have been reprinted in years best volumes and called out by uh, by locus and tangent and you know generally well received. Plus, hey, it's free to read online, so so, so check it out. Thank you. That's cool. And I think I've actually submitted stories to you before that got rejected. I'm pretty sure. Ooh, I'm sorry. Oh no, it it happens. We all get them. But I think I have. I've submitted all over the place. So. All right, let's see. And Mitchell, you're the last one on the list. What you got for us, bud? Hi, I'm Mitchell Riley. I am a postdoctoral fellow at Wake Forest School of Medicine in the lab of Dr. Rob Hampson, who I'm sure may be familiar to some people <laughs> here at LibertyCon. Um, I was invited to participate on the um, um, traumatic brain injury panel that we had a little bit ago. Um, I'm also just primarily a science person. <laughs> so my, my writing goes with more of plasticity of prefrontal cortex and cortical responses during learning in a working memory task, which is as exciting as it may sound. <laughs> so my history goes with working memory with prefrontal cortex for my dissertation work to looking at um, contextual um, base responses. So what changes in a context. So like if you have a if you have a table in your living room, you may want to put your feet up on it. But if you see that same table in a store, you're like, no, I'm not going to do that. It may be the same table, but the context differs for that. And now I'm working with Dr. Hampson and his efforts to try and get a memory prosthetic in the brain in our brain machine interface group at Wake Forest. So I may or may not be involved in his writing. He may try to rope me in with that. So we will see if I actually write any more, any in science fiction. So, Wait, That's okay. It. So if you're attached to speaker, then has he redshirted you anywhere? Probably not yet. He has not told me he has redshirted me. <laughs> he has, that, that, he has, that, that is a bad habit of most participants of Liberty Con is somebody in their little sphere of influence gets redshirted. Yeah. He's um, mentioned trying to bring me in from Tales and Tales from my sabbatical as the postdoc, but that's about all I can say. Um, we have plenty of time left. So if we if you would like to go around and give us a little snippet of what got you started in writing to start with, or well, for those of you who don't write, you know, where your passion is. We'll start with Mitchell. What got you started on it? Uh, I did a senior thesis in undergrad on concussions and kind of the, this was near the forefront of concussion um, knowledge in sports. So my background's in sports medicine. And under and when going through that thesis process, I started to learn, hey, I like this research. Hey, this is a really interesting topic. And hey, this feels like it's gonna be something big. and I guess the latter has been true because we've seen a lot of work with traumatic brain injury research, concussion research, uh, chronic uh, CTE research and knowledge. And so that got me interested and I actually worked with Dr. Hampson as a lab tech before going to grad school at WIC and kind of going into uh, other cognitive areas. <laughs> so that's really what started me. <laughs> okay. Michael, brother then. Okay, men of a certain age, you know, about 17% of us are named Michael. So uh, you, you do have to be specific. Um, it's not so popular these days, right? It's all Cody's and Logan's and what have you. But uh, men of a certain age, women too, um, might have heard of Star Trek uh, as a young lad growing up. And when I was about six, my parents put me in front of the TV and said, Michael, we think you'll like this. And it was original series, Star Trek, and I did like it. And uh, it kind of kindled uh, uh, twin interests in uh, science and science fiction both. And, uh, you know, I'm an astrophysicist now, so I can explore space. I can explore it through science with my uh, skeptical, critical thinking brain. and um, you know, go check out and investigate supermassive black holes, which are, I, I think, some of the most interesting things that exist in the entire universe. 
Um, but I can also investigate them with my imagination through fiction. Um, science is about saying, no, that won't work because, and uh, this is complicated and we have to examine it in this way or that way. And science fiction is an opportunity instead to say, well, well what is possible? Uh, not not necessarily what is, but what's possible and fits into our understanding of the limits of, of science in our physical world. And I like fantasy, I like horror, I like all kinds of speculative fiction, but uh, science fiction is kind of special because you can operate within our known limitations determined through science, and the universe is still amazingly cool. And... Uh, so, so I, I've tried to find ways uh, to amuse myself throughout my life, injecting a little science fiction into my science and science into my science fiction. And uh, I think these are the, the coolest things I can spend my time doing. So that's, that's what I've been doing the last several decades. Okay. Uh, Patrick. Well, um, as Michael said, yes, yeah, Star Trek was, uh, I think, Gosh, so 19, eight, nine years old. Yeah, um, I have to. I think I mentioned this in another panel. I, I had to ask to be excused from the table to not miss the start of Star Trek in, Mon in Montana time because it was once a week, and I saw the whole series first run a week at a time. You know, and not when in syndication, but before then, as far as writing. I don't know. I have, well, I always wanted to be a writer when I was just as far back as a little kid. I remember in the basement of our house in uh, Montana, city Montana, eastern Montana, writing these stories, just handwriting them down on paper. And um, I had this whole series. One was called Mr. Mooney Goes to the Moon. Totally unbelievable. <laughs> old guy gets a letter you're going to the moon you know says bye to his cat and takes off and there's the moon creatures and everything um, and he gets captured and put in this bowl of fruit castle which he has to eat through peppermint bars to escape from um, and then there was the there was a sequel the sequels I don't really remember very well but there was one called Mr. Mooney Goes to Mars and the third one was Mr. Mooney Goes to North Dakota because it was the only other place I knew living right near in North Dakota in Eastern Montana, uh, <laughs> alien to me. Uh, and then, um, so I knew right away, I, I just wanted to be a writer, I love that. But then I found out later in life, I have a creative writing class in my, son, in my uh, high school and I always talk to my kids about childhood memories and, and that your childhood informs a lot of, sometimes you don't even know until later of what, uh, what you might want to do in life. And I remember telling them this one time and I had my own revelation, which is going, you know, at the same time I was writing those little stories in second, third grade, I couldn't draw a lick. I had my sister was drawing artwork, little art pieces for it. And I was putting them and stapling them together in these little books. And I look back and that was like, shoot, I was going to be a publisher and editor and give me this and give me that and put it together little books and i didn't really realize that until till much later sadly those little books were lost when we moved to the western montana but um so and then i i discovered uh, tom swift and those books and of course um dune and junior high and yeah the rest was history as far as that goes and then i started going to conventions and uh, then I started looking at uh, I saw this flyer at our local Northwest Con here about Clarion West um, and I thought that's cool I'd go to I can do that during the summers and uh, went to Clarion West 1986 and then started publishing some stories afterwards and started the magazine so it's been a long long haul for us old folks that uh, started right way early for, for me 50 years ago hey but that's the passion man yeah, that's a right. passion. Michael Haspel, your turn. Yeah, so uh, I went to military school at a really, really young age, not because I was a bad kid, but actually because I wanted to. Uh, I have a long line of military. My grandfather was in the Army. My dad was in the Army. So, of course, I joined the Air Force and became a pariah. But, <laughs> but uh, uh, I went to New York Military Academy starting at the fifth grade. And there's not a lot to do in the downtime other than, like, shine your shoes, polish floors, and do chores and then we discovered a little game called Dungeons and Dragons and that's what we would do so 
we would go into the library and start writing these elaborate backstories or side quests that our characters would do when they weren't together. And it became kind of a contest between our gaming group on who could write the best story. So we would sit around and just write these stories furiously by hand and then pass them to the right and see where somebody could gasp or something like that. And so it was like feedback in real time. Like this was a garbage story or this was awesome. <laughs> and uh, the librarian there, whose name I unfortunately I forget, he would let us play in the library. And one day he came in and I had just seen, um, I just seen Conan the Barbarian. And so I was like, this was like, I think I was in eighth grade at that point, but I was just like, it was the best movie I've ever seen. It was just so over the top. And, and when I rewatch it, I'm like, I don't know what my dad was thinking, taking me to that movie. <laughs> but, but uh, he was like, Hey, what are you, what are you talking about? And I said, Conan. And he brought me back and introduced me to Robert E. Howard. And it was game over. <laughs> it was at that point, I was like, oh wow these are amazing and then of course you know tolkien david eddings all you know heinlein's juveniles all that stuff was open to me at that point point. and then i was like you know i need to contribute i need to start writing these these things yeah i'm right there with you man i, I cut my teeth on howard with conan novels uh before i even saw the movie that that's where i started my my fix on fantasy and sword and sorcery so i, I i'm right there with you uh jane where did you start? Still muted. All right, thank go. you. My cursor went missing. Um, I came a different direction. I certainly watched Star Trek, though, in syndication. Um, and But my gateway drug to wanting to, to loving stories was mythology. I was a child of the, let's experiment with kids education. I got the new math, which terrified me out of all end. To this day, uh, math remains something that I'm very proud of the fact I'm no longer terrified of. Uh, but boy, the new math did its best to scare generations of people away from ever doing anything with math. Um, the other thing that I got tossed into was the wonderful educational experience called the open classroom. You take a bunch of kids who are bright and you toss them out into a classroom and you say to them, you can do whatever you want. Now you're nine years old and you're supposed to be learning long division, but no, you can do whatever you want. So I of course went to the library and read mythology. Um, and by the time I was nine, I had uh, read the Iliad and the Odyssey in full. I'm very certain that I probably skipped over catalogs of ships and things like that. But uh, I, knew, I knew those people by heart, the Dialgers introduction to uh, Greek mythology and uh, Norse mythology. I took out of the library so many times. I thought they were my books and uh, not the library's books at all. And so my mom's rule about taking us to the library, which she did faithfully in the summer, in the, in the winter, we just ate the library at the school, um, was we could have as many books as we could carry. And that rapidly meant that I shifted over pretty young to the paperback racks, because I could carry a whole lot more paperbacks than I could carry uh, those you know, bulky hardcovers. So I started reading science fiction and fantasy because they had cool covers and I could carry a whole lot of them. And I, so I, I read and fell in love with science fiction and fantasy, also oddly enough with Westerns because they were on the next uh, turnabout rack in the store, um, which makes it not terribly surprising that I just finished doing a space Western for Gunfight at Europa Station. The two go together naturally for me. Um, so that was my, my entry, was science fiction and fantasy was familiar to me because it really uses a lot of the same larger than life uh, portrayals that you find in, uh, in mythology. Then uh, I, in, when I was a freshman in college, I became a gamer 
and have never stopped. Um, and in fact, one of my old gaming buddies is one of your Liberty Con regulars, Chuck Gannon. And Chuck and I used to sit on my uh, living room floor and with a, another group of small, small group of people and play role-playing games, hit referees sometimes, I'd referee sometimes. Um, and sometimes we'd talk about, wouldn't it be cool if someday? And, uh, and so it's, it was kind of exciting when both of us, I broke into the field earlier than he did because he decided to be a grown up longer. Um, and, uh, you know, do kids and stuff like that. I just, I just have husbands. I don't, I don't bother with kids. Um, I do books instead. So that's, that's how I got into it. And I just love it. I still game. I still watch science fiction and fantasy a lot. I'm a major anime geek. Uh, have been since the days where you had to explain to people what anime was. And, uh, you know, was a, a proud owner of many fan-subbed uh, subbed elements. So I go way back in that fandom. So there you go. Yeah, Small World with Chuck Gannon. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, even, hang smaller around. World, yeah. Even smaller world than that was in 2018, a... Uh, convention down you all's way invited us each to be guest of honor with no idea that we'd known each other since I was like 19 and he was 20. <laughs> and boy, did we have fun. We sat up there on the stage getting introduced and Chuck leaned over and stuck out his hand and said, hey, we did it, <laughs> which was just terrific. All right, Alex. Sorry about that. The mute button is uh, is, is defeating me. Uh, I grew up in uh, uh, the Russian-speaking part of Ukraine. Uh, I didn't have access to Star Trek or much television, um, that uh, speculative television anyway at all. Uh, but I did have access to books. Uh, my father was a huge collector. He loved books. He read them uh, constantly. Our, our house was always filled with them. And he imparted that love of books on me. Uh, though he could not for the life of him understand what I found interesting about uh, science fiction and fantasy. Mostly science fiction though, because fantasy was virtually non-existent in the Russian language at the time. Uh, so I, he, he, despite the fact that he didn't understand my fascination with this genre, uh, he would go out and he would procure these books for me, which was no easy task in the Soviet Union. Uh, and I grew up reading translations of Bob Silverberg and Frederick Brown, uh, and Edmund Hamilton and all sorts of genre books and you know just everything that I could find uh, both original and in translation uh, and that love of books always stayed with me. Uh, we came over to this country in 1991 and I didn't speak a word of English, never expected that I would be able to pursue uh, the career of journalism which I wanted to do uh, growing up. Uh, never expected to be able to write. Uh, so I uh, went in all sorts of other directions. Uh, I'm much more interested in experiences than in sort of like collecting things. So because of that, I got to do lots and lots of fun stuff over the course of my life. Uh, I've traveled to over 30 countries. Uh, for several years, I've played cards for a living. Uh, I'm an award-winning game designer. Uh, I've done all kinds of things over time. Uh, but I've never given up the love, of, the love of science fiction, but that love was always at a distance. I've never been, until I started writing uh, my own stories and become a published author, I've never been to a real science fiction convention. I've been to like the pop, pop culture, like, you know, Comic-Con type places, but I never actually interacted with a living science fiction author in person. Uh, even though I've read just about everything that was coming out as much as I could, uh, so it took me a really long time to get to the point where I just, you know, kind of gathered the courage to try and write something in English. And uh, um, I just never looked back. I'm trying to make up for lost time and hang out with some of my literary heroes. I mean, I got to meet that Bob, Bob Silverberg in, in person and work with him and a lot of the other um, writers that, uh, that that were really foundational for me as a as a reader and as a writer over time. So I'm just uh, enjoying every moment of it. And, uh, you know, hanging out with uh, with folks like my fellow writers here is, uh, is pretty much the best part of it. All right. Yeah, Silverberg is a cool guy. I, I've actually got him headlining on an anthology for Three Ravens. Um, 
Let's see, Stephen, you're next. Thanks. Yeah. So uh, my story is has a lot of like weird detours that then pay off and become inevitable in retrospect. Uh, but, but going up like science fiction was sort of part of the back background radiation in my house. You know, there was box of movies, my, my father and my, my older brother. And um, but then I actually went to university to study um, experimental physics. And in Ireland at that time, there was actually there was no there was no J school, actually, you know, even I had been decided I want to be a writer right now. I could have gone to an English department, but if I decided I want to be a journalist, there was no J school. But I was very lucky in that at my university, Trinity College Dublin, there was and still is an incredibly active student publication scene. There are no faculty advisors. There's nothing like this. There's just, here's some facilities and we have to like, actually we get some money, we have to raise some other money and every students just teach each other and after I did that for a few years, I actually, that's how I kind of like, like learned how to be an editor, um, which is interestingly a skill that's not really even taught in, in J schools at all. Um, but I came out of that thinking, oh, okay, I'm going to be a staff writer, I'm going to be an editor, I'm going to be a science journalist, because, you know, I did, I did do this degree in experimental physics, I should use it for something, okay. And that kind of rolled me along. But at the same time in college, I was actually very involved in the science fiction society there. And for complicated, weird reasons, the science fiction society of Trinity College was ridiculously overfunded um, for its size. And so in the early 90s, we were able to like bring in all of the, the like, bring in authors um, from Ireland and England and have them talk. So I got to meet people like Terry Pratchett, uh, Ian McDonald, Ian M. Banks, Anne McCaffrey. Um, Harry Harrison, all these kind of, it was just, it was just this amazing time, which kind of just went kind of back into the background. And then many years later, when I was working at Discover Magazine, the publisher there said, hey, we should start up a, a kind of a science, uh, science fiction blog, kind of any volunteers kind of a thing. So I put my hand up as the, as the science fiction guy. And um, that really, and then blossomed, and then we went and we did like a couple of panels at San Diego Comic Con, and that's where how I got to meet Kevin Grazier, and we started writing on those books, and then I moved to MIT Technology Review, and there Jason Ponton, uh, I would say, was was a guy saying he was very aware of the interplay between science and science fiction, and he really wanted us to start doing, start like, could we spin off like some hard science fiction? And that's where those anthologies came out. I really, I'm indebted to Jason for basically giving somebody who had who you know was that was a a non-fiction editor was a magazine editor go and go and find a bunch of science fiction authors and get them to write for you and then edit them and uh, it was really amazing then working with people like Cory Doctorow and uh, David Brin and so on we were just we just got really really lucky the fact that we were paying closer to, to um you know magazine rates as opposed to actual normal fiction rates um really helped in terms of people because we were offering 30 40 cents a word and people um were like yay well i'll, I'll answer I'll, at the very least we'll answer your email so that's kind of how how i got into it a whole series of things that are that are accidents um and then and then paid off later on and um here i am now actually finally completing through the process as i say now from being an, an, an editor who commissions stuff and who is the editor and the gatekeeper into now actually be, being the writer who must now go, please, sir, take it. So that's so, so that's kind of my uh, my little journey. All right, all right, and Jenny. If now that it let me unmute. Um, Okay, I've always been a voracious reader. My family were readers, everything else. My grandmother was huge into Star Trek and she was huge into hard science fiction. However, I didn't, like everybody else, want to join. Really, I wanted to own a casino. I ran a gambling hall in ninth grade in my English teacher's classroom. And the saddest day of my, my school career was when he said I had to give the money back. And I'm like, but the house always wins and I'll split with you. And he's like, I need my job and my insurance. And if you don't give the money back, I'm going to jail and you're going to juvie. So uh, so my first goal did not happen, um, but I read everything. I went to school for international business. Uh, I fell in love with marketing, became a marketing professional. It's still honestly my first love. I love everything about marketing. I can talk about direct marketing at the drop of a hat, which is somewhat embarrassing uh, to my husband, but not to anybody else. Um, 
but I've always had story ideas in the back of my head. I just had voices in my head and I just, you know, thought, hey, I'm just borderline crazy and whatever. And finally, they got so loud that I had to write them down. And I was supposed to be working on a telemarketing script for a manager I loathe beyond belief. And it was a beautiful day. My husband and our daughter were out taking a hike and I'm stuck in on a Saturday writing a telemarketing script. And I thought, oh, I'm just going to quickly write this down and shut these characters up. And like eight hours later, I looked up and I never looked back. So that's kind of how I got started. But what I was writing at the start was deadly serious. I mean, like deadly serious. And it wasn't, I was very serious author. And it it wasn't going anywhere. And one of my friends, I would tell, I, we'd go to parties, we'd go to all these things together. And she'd be like, you tell these hilarious stories. Why don't you write them down? You could be the next David Sedaris. I'm like, right, sure. But she said it enough that I did it. And my first sales were actually short humor pieces. And if that hadn't happened, when I started writing Touched by an Alien, which was, wait for it, supposed to be very grim and dark, and it started coming out funny, I let it ride. And that gave me my career. Uh, so it's, it's a long and winding road, but, and yeah, being an author, I use marketing every day, please buy my books. Uh, so, but one thing I wanted to say is the, um, what the power editors have is really wonderful. Alex was the first person to ever invite me into an anthology. I'd been in anthologies before, but it was either through slush or through my agent. Um, and Alex was like, Hey, would you like to be in my anthology? And I'm like, where are the cameras? Where are the hidden cameras? So I will always love Alex dearly. <laughs> Do any, he, I'll drop anything for Alex because that's a really wonderful thing. So, so that was an exciting place to be. I knew I'd made it when someone finally introduced, it invited me in. Yeah, it's a whole other feeling when somebody invites you instead of you're fighting, fighting, fighting against all the masses. Yeah. Yes. All right. So thank you all for coming and joining and watching this panel for the the this year's newbies um i'm your host and moderator william joseph roberts you can find my stuff over at williamjosephroberts.com or three ravens publishing.com and uh well we're right at the time limit so thank you thank you liberty con thank see you. you all next year bye bye